Hello, and welcome back to another week of Mad Times with Madison. Happy 1989 Day to all those who celebrate. 1989 came out today, the day that I'm recording this, so it speaks volume to my dedication that I am doing this right now before I have even finished listening to the re-records. And here's my cat to tell you more. Just kidding. Thank you for your continued support. Um, I can see all of you listening, and it feels really great. Don't. Do not. Oh, Jesus Christ. Please get off. RV. Recording with a four-month-old cat is just, like, not the most chill environment to insert oneself in, but this is what I have chosen for myself. I don't remember what I was talking about. Thank you for listening. Um, I can see all of your support. I can see all of the listens and all of that, and it feels really great to go out on a limb and try something new that is kind of scary and see it sort of work out, so thank you, and don't forget you can always subscribe on Apple Podcasts or the Patreon if you want that episode every Friday also. And on that note, I think that I will get started. So last week I talked about how I had like spent the week re- researching a case that I had always wanted to do that I was really excited to do. And I talked about like perhaps I will skip everything else. Well, I did skip everything else I'm going to do. So I am doing Andrew Cunanan today. Uh, if you don't know who that is... Okay, thank you, Harvey. It will, you know who he is. Even if you don't think you do, you do. So, Andrew Philip Cunanan was born August 14th, 1969 to Modesto and Mary Ann, which Modesto is kind of a cool name. I kept reading it wrong, like he was born in Modesto, like where Scott Peterson was from. But his father's name was Modesto. His dad was in the Navy and was away for long periods of time in the beginning of their marriage. This caused some problems in the marriage, as Modesto was constantly accusing Marianne of cheating on him, and even said their second child, their daughter Elena, wasn't his. Shocker. Nonetheless, they stayed together. They had another daughter, Regina, in 1967, and after she had Andrew, she was clinically depressed. They said that being a devout Italian Catholic and her husband's claims of infidelity took a toll on her. But I'm sure today that we would heavily factor in postpartum depression. So she was actually unable to care for Andrew because she was so depressed. I think she had like had to go somewhere to get better. She wasn't able to take care of him immediately. So Modesto started raising Andrew all by himself and he loved to brag about it. And he loved to brag about how Andrew never cried and how he was taking care of Andrew all by himself. Like, you know, when people say that, like, dads are babysitting their kids, that's, like, this type of energy. Like, congratulations on doing the absolute bare minimum. So, despite all of that, Andrew had a pretty normal childhood. They were fine financially. He didn't really want for anything. Like, he had pretty much everything that he could have wanted. He fit in with his friends, everything like that. His parents actually sort of spoiled him. They would tell him how special he was and how much better he was than everyone else and how he was going to be rich one day, which I just don't really think you should be gassing up your children like that. You need to, like, prepare. You, like, they need to go down a bit before they come up. You can't just start with that type of optimism in the world. Please. Thank you, Harvey, for that. Can you please get off the buttons? Harvey, get down. Can you please get down? Can you please get down? Get down. This is great. This is amazing. Okay. Get down. Get down. So anyway, they're gassing this kid up. They would even buy him a sports car. They let him have the master bedroom. This is this is Regina George. This is the male... <laughs> RV, get down, please. Stop. Ah. Amazing. I'm going to leave all that in there. I don't care. So, male Regina and George, where were we? His family is, they're too much. You can't, you can't give too, this much. It, they sort of described Andrew as like the white sheep of the family. Like he was the opposite of like a disgrace, 
and an outcast, and it was almost treated like he was an only child, even though he had three other siblings. His parents were still regularly fighting, and it didn't outwardly affect Andrew, but it would always be in the back of his mind. He was taking note of how his family was, how his mom was scared of his dad, how his dad controlled all of them, and he just assumed that all families looked happy, but actually weren't, because he was aware that, like, to the outsider looking in, everything probably looked great, and he knew that it was all a facade. He's like, they think this, but I know for sure that that's not what's going on. So he's like, all families are probably like that. He's like, I'm looking at these families that look so great, and they probably also have a shitty home life. And he decided that like, he has no interest in repeating the cycle. He doesn't ever want to get married. He doesn't want a family. He's all out on that. So Andrew started to become a bit of an embellisher. Some would say a pathological liar. I think he just got sick of his home life and family, so he decided to just pretend they weren't like that. He's like, okay, well. But what if they weren't? He would talk about how supportive his dad was and how rich they were. And he would name off all the things his dad was buying him as his classmates would make fun of him because they just knew he was making stuff up. He would occasionally back it up by doing something extravagant. So every once in a while he would come through like, see, I told you. I think he had his mom bring him like a hot lobster dinner for lunch once. And he's like, see, I am rich. And then, after his father retired from the Navy, he decided to take some classes and go into stockbroking, which he made some money from. He didn't do terrible at first, and he got Andrew some really nice clothes. So, not only did the kids at school make fun of him for being a liar, with his new clothes, they also made fun of him because they said he was gay. They were like, okay, well, now you're gay, because you're dressing too nice. It sounded like Andrew didn't really care because it was more important to be somebody and his new clothes sort of gave him this platform to be somebody. He's like, okay, well, at least you're talking about me type of deal. His parents ended up transferring him to a private school when he was 12 anyway, where he fit right in with the other people who dressed and acted like him. So it was just like a school of Andrew Cunanan's. Also, in 1981, the school they sent him to cost $7,000 a year in tuition. And when I plugged it into my handy dandy u.s inflation calculator it would be the equivalent of about twenty three thousand dollars a year for a school for a 12 year old i don't even think i paid that much to go to college granted i did go to the university of toledo but still so he fit in more he he stood out he was outwardly bright and talkative but inside he was not the same he felt kind of awkward and he was confused about how he felt about boys and girls and found himself drawn to people who were more weak and mild, and most of them happened to be boys. So he's not going for the strong, independent women. He is not. And it didn't take long for him to be sure who he liked, He and he was absolutely not shy about it. He had his first experience with someone of the same sex in his early teens, and he said it was just so much better than the few experiences he had with girls. So that's what he told all his classmates. He's like, listen, it was kind of great. The boys thought he was kidding because he was so upfront about it. They're like, you are fucking with us. And honestly, that worked in Andrew's favor because he was so open and passionate about it. It was almost impossible for people to make fun of him for it. So they just left him alone. They continued to be his friend, which kids are terrible. And yes, this sounds like the bare minimum of decency. But I think it's kind of a semi-big deal. First of all, what is this? The 1980s? And factoring in that kids are so, so mean. I think it kind of a big deal that they decided to stay friends with him and not give him shit for it. So by the time he was 15, he looked old enough where he could frequent the gay bars and drink without any problems. I am so sorry if I'm making mouth noises. I'm trying really, really hard not to. If you're new here, I have like a borderline phobia of mouth noises, so I try not to do it. So don't think I had to stop listening to a certain true crime podcast because one of the co-hosts would not stop making mouth noises, so I understand, and I'm going to try and make it better for you. Okay, so he's frequent in these gay bars. He's 15. He has no problem because he looks much older than he is. But on the surface, he still didn't like himself. So So he curated the perfect life for himself as 
at his old school, and then he just never stopped. So now he was, like, curating his perfect self. He's like, okay, my childhood was focused on making sure people thought, like, I had a good home life, had good parents and a good family, but, like, now I want people to think that I'm happy and I'm great. He wanted to be glamorous. He pretended to be Latino instead of Filipino, going by the name Andrew Da Silva or David Morales at the clubs. He would change his personality every night. The crime library said that people would spend hours with him one night and then not recognize him the very next night. That's like how much he would change. He just really did not like parts of himself, so he reinvented like an entire new self. Andrew Cunanan ceases to exist. He was also voted most likely to be remembered in high school. And after he graduated, he enrolled at the University of California to study history, which he didn't do great at. First of all, because his it was his parents who really wanted him to go to college. I don't think he really wanted to go at all. And second of all, he was still really focused on the club scene. He, like, was not passing his classes because he would rather go to the clubs. The clubs were all fam, fam in the club. If you haven't watched Broad City, it is fantastic. Okay. And it was in this era of club scene that Andrew sort of discovered what we would call now sugar daddies. He discovered sugar daddies. He realized that other men his age were going after the much older, wealthier guys who frequented the clubs. So he's like, okay, well, why am I going for these young hotties and everyone else my age is going for these old dudes? What do they know that I don't know? These were men with careers and families who would just pay the gay men at these clubs for, like, their little fantasies on the side. And he wouldn't have just one-night stands with these wealthier men. He would say that one-night stands were meant for men like construction workers and policemen. And these wealthy men paid well. And Andrew knew what they wanted, and they both knew that he was a male prostitute. He knew he could be in high demand. Like, he really, after he discovered sugar daddies, he was like, oh, this is this is my thing. I know what I'm worth. I know what I can bring to the table. And honestly, so did the people he was clienting. From them, he got things like a $30,000 car. From others, they would just give them, not them, they would give him, like, their credit cards to use whenever he wanted on whatever he wanted. He enjoyed the fine life with these people like he always wanted. He was going to parties in uptown apartments. He would be living in their secret apartments. He would be invited to events as these men's, like, assistant or associate. So while Andrew is seemingly thriving, his family is falling apart. His father was a horrible Stoke Brocker. Stoke Brocker? <laughs> Stock broker? <laughs> oh, wow. Isn't that weird how your brain does that? Why did I say that in the opposite thing? His father was a terrible stockbroker and was accused of stealing well over $100,000 from the business, and he fled the country, so perhaps he did. He left Marianne there alone with no job. He didn't, like, take his wife with him or anything. She had to sell the house and move to a much smaller house, and her children helped out where they could. Also, she had started to get privy to the rumors that Andrew was gay, which she was not okay with. Like I said, she was like a devout Italian Catholic. This is not okay with her. And when she confronted him about it, they got in a huge fight, and he pushed her so hard that he dislocated her shoulder, and he did genuinely feel sorry about it and tried to apologize, but she, like, was not having it. And good for her. So probably out of, sp- out of spite for this, he dropped out of college He flew to the Philippines to visit his dad. Probably like, well, I'm going to go stay with dad. I like dad better than you anyway. Well, that was short-lived because when he got there, his dad was a mess. He was living in a shack in a dirty neighborhood. So Andrew spent almost all of his time in the Philippines in the red light district, sleeping with people to make enough money to immediately go back to California. He was like, oh, yeah, no, I can't do this, actually. You have, like, no plumbing or floor. You are not the man that I thought you were. So maybe he didn't steal $100,000 because it sounds like from everything I read, this man was living in squalor. I also read it was possible that Andrew went there to get the money back from his father and got there and realized his father actually didn't have any money, like I said, and then left. Either way, whatever reason he went there for, it was extremely short-lived. So he got back. San Francisco was a breath of fresh air to Andrew. He spent a lot of time in the Castro District being his favorite alias, um, Navy Lieutenant Dan Cummings, his favorite person to pretend to be. So the Castro District 
is where he really starts to come into everything he wanted. These people were very, very wealthy, and he gained a new friend, Eli Gould, who was able to introduce him to a world of celebrities and supermodels. It's sort of in this circle where he first meets Gianni Versace. And as Maureen Orth tells it, the designer walked in with an entourage who quickly introduced him to a few people. After about 15 minutes of chit-chat and waves of young men eager to meet him, Versace began to survey the room. He noticed Andrew standing with Eli. He cocked his head and walked in their direction. He said, I know you, to Andrew. And then he said, Lago di Como, no, which Versace was referring to the house that he owned in Lake Como near the Swiss border. So he was sort of like, I know you, you are at my lake house, right? Andrew was ecstatic, because this is obviously not true. And Eli just couldn't believe it, because I'm sure Andrew was telling all these weird-ass lies about how fabulous he is. And then Versace comes up and talks to him directly about knowing him. So Andrew just goes along with it. He's like, that's right. Thank you for remembering me, Senor Versace. And it is sort of around this time that Andrew's like chill demeanor started to change into something darker underneath. He started to like lose grip on his sanity or like lose his self image. I'm not sure. People just described him as being just mean. He would just turn dark and moody. But people did always say as he was creating these facades and characters, his eyes were always the same. His eyes were always dark and moody. Like he couldn't quite get rid of who he really was underneath all of these lies. He would embarrass himself in front of celebrities. He asked Lisa Kudrow, Phoebe from Friends, to get him a screen test at a party, and she left. And he searched the party for her. He, She was like, oh, just ignored him, and then Irish goodbye the party. And then he spent the entire rest of the party going around talking about what a bitch she was and looking for her. He met Hugh Grant at a celebrity gala. I love Hugh Grant. Days later, when Andrew tried out for a walk-on role for a Grant film and wasn't chosen, he became convinced that Hugh Grant personally had something to do with it. He was like, they told them something directly about me so that I wouldn't be in this movie. It has nothing to do with his talent or anything. He had like a shrine in his bedroom to Tom Cruise. And his friend said he spent the whole night talking shit about Nicole Kidman because he was so jealous that she had Tom Cruise, and he never would. He's like, I hate her for stealing my man. Little did he know that she actually didn't like him at all. Spurred one of my most favorite pictures of all time. Double hands in the air leaving the divorce lawyer. I've almost never seen a happier-looking woman in my life, and for good reason. And then Toledo's own, our girl Katie Holmes married Tom Cruise, which I was excited for just because... She's from Toledo, and now she was getting, like, super famous. She had always been. Dawson's Creek, she had always been famous, but this was, like, a new level. And then it turns out that Tom Cruise's problem, as we all suspected. Man's not right. Scientology, not right. Anyway, that's a whole, I could do a whole different thing. He's just, okay. So he's just losing it. Whatever. It was made even worse when his older lover, Norman Blanchford, broke things off with him. So he had been seeing this older man. He would get $2,000 a month from him to do whatever he wanted with. was sort of like his allowance. I think he lived in one of his, like, uptown apartments. But he told Norman that he was Andrew De Silva, the son of a pineapple plantation owner, which is just the weirdest thing to make up. He was like, he made up this story like he was an heir to this whole operation. I don't know. Well, Norman found out that he was just Andrew Cunan and there was nothing there, a nobody, and then he broke things off with him. So not only did he lose a friend, more importantly, he lost his income because he doesn't have a job. I think I had read, like, he only had one job in his whole life, working at, like, a gas station when he was, like, much, much younger. So not only is he mentally losing it, at this point he had just turned 28, which is young, don't get me wrong, but Andrew said at that time, Passing your mid-20s in the gay scene was sort of, like, considered old and on your way out. Probably, like, modeling or football. Because 28 is not old. It's not. I'm only saying that because I'm 30. So, anyway, 28. He's on his way out. He's considered old. He has almost no friends. So, he just also physically started to lose it. He gave up trying. 
he stopped cutting his hair and wearing nice clothes like he loved. He gained 30 pounds. He started drinking and doing painkillers. He had convinced himself he had AIDS because he had several of the symptoms, and he still believed it even when the test came back negative. So he has a lot going on in his mind. He's not okay. And then to add to all of that, his two lovers that he had been with had started seeing each other behind his back. So Jeff Trail was a young Navy officer when he met Andrew in 1992. They secretly saw each other for a while until Jeff left the military, sick of sort of hiding who he was because you were not allowed to be gay in the military. He got a managerial job in Minneapolis and moved. Andrew was heartbroken. Jeff's sister reported to the New York Times that Cunanan idolized him. She said when Jeff got a haircut, Andrew had to have the same haircut. When Jeff went to San Francisco and got a hat, Andrew had to do the same thing, just like that kind of person, and said that is that is what actually pushed Jeffrey away from Andrew, like it was just a bit much. Another person who had distanced themselves from Andrew was David Madsen, another lover he used to have. It's alleged that Andrew's lying had embarrassed them, and they were just so sick of being associated with him that they had wanted to get away with it. So Jeff moved to Minneapolis, and then separately, before Jeff moved there, David Madsen had moved to Minneapolis for some separate reason. So Andrew went to visit them in Minneapolis, I think to try and, like, rekindle something with them. But Jeff and David were said to have stated that they were going to use the weekend Andrew was in town to sort of let him down, tell him they had no interest in a relationship with him. Which would suck because Andrew already suspected they were seeing each other behind his back. So this is not going to help their cause of them jointly telling him, like, we don't want to be with you. He's going to say, oh, it's because you two are together. Aside from that, this was sort of a reflection for Andrew, seeing the two of them with their careers. And I think their families were okay with them being gay. It was just sort of showing Andrew everything he wasn't and everything he didn't have at the time. Jeffrey Trill's sister also told the New York Times that it's possible Andrew was already angry with Jeffrey because Jeffrey had warned people in Minneapolis that Andrew would possibly take advantage of older men for money. And that obviously pissed Andrew off because that is exactly how he makes his money. He's like, okay, well, great, thanks. So Andrew told his roommates he was going to Minneapolis for the weekend. So once his friends... At home, figure out where he was going. They called David to warn him. They just wanted to tell him, like, hey, Andrew's been acting really weird lately. David replied, well, I think he just needs a friend, and I think he's trying to get his life straightened out. He just needs somebody. So David picked him up from the airport on April 26, 1997, and planned to take him to his apartment. Over the weekend, Jeff and David both talked to Andrew separately and both let him know, like, I don't want to get back together with you. And Jeff had even said, like, he wasn't even interested in a friendship with him. They just sort of tried to sever all ties with Andrew at this time. So on Saturday, Andrew is at Jeff's apartment alone and steals his gun. And then on Sunday, Andrew left Jeff a message saying, hey, I'm at David's. Why don't you come over here? I promise I can make all of our friendships work. Like, let's just, let's talk it out one more time, see if anything can work. Uh, the tension was so bad when they were all in that apartment, like terrible. Jeff and Andrew just started screaming at each other. It just instantly turned into a mess and, like, quickly turned actually violent. And David is just standing there trying to calm everyone down. Around 9.45 p.m., the neighbors started complaining about how loud it was. David said he saw Andrew dart into the kitchen and grab a heavy club hammer, and Jeff saw this happen at the same time. They're, like, slow motion. Everyone is seeing what is going on. But before anyone could do anything, Andrew hit Jeff in the head over and over again until he fell to the ground. Blood was splattered everywhere. David had no idea what he just saw. He panicked. He helped Andrew wrap Jeff's body up in the rug. For two days, they left Jeff's body in the apartment before they could get rid of it. Around this time, neighbors said they saw the two coming and going from the apartment like nothing was wrong. However, you do have to consider the possibility that Andrew was holding David hostage. Basically saying, like, if you don't help me, I'm going to kill you, or I'm going to tell everyone that you killed Jeff, something like that. But David wasn't going to work. So his coworkers called him, and when they couldn't get a hold of him, they asked his landlord to check on him. Well, his landlord gets to his house and finds a full-on crime scene, because remember, this took place in David's apartment, not Jeff's. So he gets in the apartment, 
He sees blood everywhere. He instantly sees Jeff's body. So Andrew and David catch wind of this, get the hell out of there in David's car. Andrew also had Jeff's gun with him with three bullets in it and another seven bullets in his pocket. Police found Andrew's backpack in David's apartment, like with his full on fucking name tag on it. And when they were searching Jeff's apartment to figure out why someone would want to murder him, they found a message on his machine from Andrew inviting him over to David so they could talk. So there is almost no mystery to who did this crime to the police immediately. So Andrew is driving him and David out of the city. And about 45 miles out of Minneapolis, Andrew pulls over and shoots David three times. There were two shots in his back and one in the front of his head. So they think he might have tried to jump out of the car and run. Andrew got him in the back and then went up, rolled him over and finished the job. The murder, this makes the murder of Jeff especially alarming because we know Andrew had a gun, knew how to use it, and was prepared to use it, and he chose to beat Jeffrey to death anyway. I think that speaks to the amount of rage he had in him or, like, how hurtful he wanted to be. Like, he wanted it to be terrible for everyone. Unfortunately, Andrew was not done. About a week later, on May 3rd, 1997, He was driving David's car, still around Chicago, and he saw a man standing on his front porch. That man was 73-year-old Lee Miglin. It is assumed that Andrew was probably on some type of drug. He was going through a breakdown. He was angry, and he decided to take it out on the first person that he saw. However, there is another theory that Andrew and Lee did know each other, and that Lee and Andrew were intimate, and that's why this happened. A former FBI agent said it's unlikely Andrew would have targeted someone randomly and killed them the way he kills Lee. There were rumors that Andrew knew his 25-year-old son, Duke, possibly, and that's how this happened. We will honestly never know. Both sides of this are very confident in their assumptions. Lee Miglin's family, to this day, is adamant that Lee had no connection, no idea who Andrew Cunanan was. And the FBI and people are saying, like, it it would be very weird for this super random murder. Like, why, how did he end up near Lee Miglin's house? Lee Miglin is also the kind of older guy Andrew would have went for. He was very prominent in his city. He was rich, wealthy, whatever. Both sides maintain their stance pretty strongly. So, I don't know. So, the account of what happened here is unclear. But based on the crime scene and evidence and such, it was thought that Andrew probably led Lee into his own garage. He then bound Lee's hands and taped his face with duct tape, leaving only a nose hole, and proceeded to beat Lee until he stabbed him in the chest with a pair of pruning shears, which are like small shears, like smaller than like smaller than your average pair of scissors, probably. There are also... Some places say it was, like, gardening shears. Is that what I said? No, pruning shears. Some people say it might have been gardening shears, which are, like, much larger. Um, Some places say he was stabbed with a screwdriver. It was, like, very hard to pinpoint what it was. But either way, he stabbed Lee in the chest. Then, while Lee was still alive, Andrew cut his neck with a hacksaw, which is, like, that um, super thin saw. And then... He took Lee's body and ran it over with his own car. Like, several times he ran over Lee's body. Like, he did a lot, which is why the FBI is like, it would be very weird to do this to someone you had absolutely no connection to for no reason. And then Andrew goes into the Miglin's house because Lee's wife is out of town at this point. He eats some food. He drinks a glass of orange juice. He watched some of their home movies. He then slept in their bed. He woke up, stole some coins, and then left with the Miglins Lexus. So his wife gets home. He was supposed to pick her up from the airport. He didn't, so she's kind of worried. She gets home, immediately sees what's wrong. So the F, um, the police obviously found David's Jeep parked like right around the way from the Miglin house, and the Jeep had photos of Andrew in it, so it's not hard to connect the dots. They're like, all right, this is the man from the other murders. So the FBI gets involved because he's, like, crossing state lines. He's leaving a trail of bodies. They put him on their top ten most wanted list. 
which reminds me of America's Most Wanted, which used to full on stress me out as a child. Like I knew in my heart of hearts that the missing man who murdered a bunch of people in Washington was for certain in my backyard right now. I have a lot of paranoia and anxiety. And that just didn't help. Neither did time tests, actually. Anyway, they issued a bolo for Andrew, a be on the lookout. And it proves easy to find him because he had, he had been using the car phone. If you don't know, before cell phones were invented, super rich people had, um, like, corded or maybe even cordless phones in their car. So you can, like, talk on the phone in your car. Revolutionary technology at the time. So he had been using that, so they were able to track him headed towards Philadelphia. So awesome, great. They alert the police to stop the green Lexus when they see it. He's armed, he's dangerous, be aware. One problem with this, this is like being broadcast on the radio or TV or something. So Andrew hears it, and then he throws the phone out of the window. He's like, whoops. And then they immediately lost him. They had no idea where he went. They said it was like he just vanished from thin air. And just to say something about Lee Miglin, him and his wife were described as, like, amazing people. They raised a lot of money for their neighborhood. Their neighbors said they were just, like, fantastic people. They were, like, very prominent in the work that they did for their community, things like that. So we'll never really know why that happened, but it is just terrible anyway. So Andrew then lands in New Jersey undetected, specifically the Finns Point Cemetery in Pinsville. He was aware that the description of the car and the license plate had been blasted everywhere, so he needed to find a different car to use. He saw a red pickup truck parked outside of the caretaker's house at the cemetery and went and knocked on the door. 45-year-old William Reese was inside and went to answer the door. Andrew acted like he needed some water to take an aspirin. And when he was getting him a glass of water, Andrew pulled out his gun and told him he needed his truck. So William was like, okay, whatever, fine, take it. I don't want any problems, whatever. So he reached out to give Andrew the keys, and then Andrew shot him anyway. William worked at the cemetery because he genuinely loved the history of it. He was a quiet, nice man who, like, loved his job there. He was buried with a six-gun salute by his Civil War reenactment group. He left behind a wife and a son. So, obviously, again, it was not hard to figure out who did it. He left the Miglin's car there. And, honestly, people are starting to panic now. They don't know where he is. They have no idea where he's going because he just keeps popping up in random places. And he's just randomly killing people in these places. Another concern was they were super aware of how easily Andrew could transform into someone else. So they distributed several different flyers with him looking different just in case he was like going to these places and changing his looks. They were also 100% certain that he was going to kill again. So time was of the essence. So time was really of the essence here. And honestly, nobody can think of a motive for why he's doing it. So that's even more terrifying because it truly could be anyone there. They could make sense of Jeff and David, maybe, perhaps. There was a theory floating around that Jeff gave Andrew HIV and Andrew retaliated at him and then killed David as a witness. However, even if that was true, it doesn't explain Lee at all. And then he only killed William to get a car but he didn't even need to kill William. On May 10th, 1997, Andrew arrived in Miami Beach and ditched William's truck. He checked into a hotel, booking it for monthly increments. He made zero attempt to hide while there. He went out during the day. He walked around. He went to the gay bars at night, even though he knew police would be like on high alert for him there. He would wear disguises, but that wasn't out of the ordinary for him anyway. He shaved his head, he wore a mohawk, he wore glasses and a hat during the day. But he is, like, literally just out there living his life while being on the top 10 most wanted FBI list. But this went on for so long that the media started to focus on other things, which allowed Andrew to get away with more and more. And what he wanted to get away with doing this time was pretty bold. Gianni Versace was born into a not-wealthy family in Calabria, Italy, By 1995, his fashion brand Versace was worth over $900 million. I only typed $900. His fashion brand Versace was worth over $900. That is not correct. July 12, 1997, Gianni returned to his mansion at Miami Beach 
And this mansion is gorgeous, by the way. You can go there today. They have like a little cafe. I don't know if it's a full restaurant, like inside. And I think you can even stay there if you're like real super rich. I think I saw a TikTok of people who had went there because I have always wanted to go there. It's gorgeous. I loved his. I love the style of Versace. And I think they had like gotten two salads and like two pops, maybe two wines or something. And it was like a hundred bucks. So uh, take your wallet or take your sugar daddy, you know, whatever. Anyway, he had just gotten back from a super big tour of London he was doing for his fashion line. And he was talking about how he was ready to settle down, relax, lay low, have more privacy. He was around 50 years old now and he had been like doing this for a very, very long time. He's like, I'm look very much looking forward to just like settling down here. Well, Andrew had been looking for him. He would go to Versace's favorite gay clubs, and every morning he would walk by the Versace mansion to Ocean Drive, where there was a little news cafe where Gianni Versace would walk to to get his favorite coffee, usually alone. So, it was July 17th, 1997, when Gianni Versace left his mansion to go get his morning coffee. I think he would pick up, like, the fashion magazines. He's walking back to his mansion he turned to unlock the gate to get back in when Andrew Cunanan came up and fired two shots into his head. A witness told the Miami Herald that he saw Cunanan sitting in the grass across from Versace's mansion. He said he saw Versace walk back up to his gate and smiled at him. I think people were very, very familiar with Versace in this neighborhood. He seemed like a very friendly man. Just like one of those, like, oh yeah, Versace lives there. Kind of. He's very nice. Talks to his neighbors, things like that. And then the witness said he saw someone walking, like, really fast towards Versace. And not, like, a normal walk either. Like, a very stiff arm to the side type of thing. But the guy just assumed it was, like, an admirer or something wanting to say hi. He said it happened so fast that Versace didn't have time to turn around. After he fired two shots back to back, he just turned around and walked down the street calmly like nothing happened. According to the New York Times, one neighbor, David Todini, said in an interview that... A day before the Versace killing, he saw someone who resembled Mr. Cunanan walking on the sidewalk about a block away from the boathouse, but he said he didn't think to report the sighting until today. He said, I couldn't make the call. Everybody looks like Cunanan. Inside the gates, an ominous feeling immediately came over Versace's partner of 11 years, Antonio D'Amico. He said, I felt as if my blood had turned to ice. He and their butler jumped up. He said the house had stained glass windows, so we couldn't see what had happened from inside, so we had to open the gate. He said, I saw Gianni lying on the steps with blood around him. At that point, everything went dark. I was pulled away. I didn't see anymore. By 9.15, Versace was transported to a hospital seven miles away, but shortly after was pronounced dead. Versace's memorial was held in Italy and attended by over 2,000 people, including... Elton John, Naomi Campbell, and Princess Diana. Versace was a large part of Diana's wardrobe transformation after her divorce. He, like, worked with her a lot to sort of find her personal style, get out of, like, the stuffy clothes that she didn't really like wearing in the royal family. I think he had also named a bag after her. Um, Sadly, Princess Diana would go on to die in a car accident the very next month. Other prominent fashion designers made statements when the news came out, according to Biography.com. Giorgio Armani said, according to The Guardian, my reaction is one of revolt against such an unnatural and violent death. The shock of this tragedy devastates me. Valentino Garavani, best known as just Valentino, said, according to CNN, I can't believe he's not still with us. Designer Gianfranco said, there are no words to describe how I feel right now. What happened is absurd, unexplainable, terrible. I only feel infinite pain. It was speculated that maybe Andrew had been hiding out in Miami these past few months specifically to kill Gianni Versace. Versace was loved and respected in the gay community and the fashion world. And when he met Versace at that party, he probably built it up in his mind as a much bigger deal than it was and started to become a little obsessed with him. And when his life started to fall apart, he got jealous thinking of Versace. I always assumed before I read this case that they knew each other, like, sort of well, like, acquaintances before this. But his family insists that that was not the case, that they had never met before, except that one time that he, like, mistook him for... Mistook, I don't think that's a word. 
where he thought he was someone else at the club. So they didn't know each other at all. So this was a huge deal, obviously. Hundreds of FBI agents were dispatched to Miami, and all local police dropped every other thing they were working on to try and find Andrew Cunanan. And at this point, Cunanan is sort of trapped in a way he hasn't been yet. He had killed random people across different states that are handled by different districts. So he was able to just sort of flee and move on. However, when he killed the international celebrity, his name and face were everywhere. Every TV, every airport in the area had something with his face on it. All of that. So he was going to have an extremely hard time moving on after doing this one. Also, every missed opportunity to capture Andrew at this point was just blown up. Every mistake the police made along this multi-country murder spree was severely criticized, especially because while Andrew was gallivanting around Miami, people reported seeing him and nothing was done about it, nor was anyone in the area notified that Andrew was in the area. The gay community was especially furious because they weren't notified he was in the area because he, the, he ran in their circles and they felt like they were huge targets. One employee of a restaurant he ate at actually recognized him and called 911, but his coworker did not recognize him, hand him his food, let him leave, and the police got there after he had already left. So they were aware he was in Miami and never notified anyone. And if they had, Versace may have never been killed. And honestly, there are several other gigantic mess ups that stop them from catching Andrew. First of all, William Reese's truck sat untouched in the parking garage for two months. If they knew Andrew was in town, I don't know why they would not be on the lookout for one, a red Chevy pickup truck. And two, there was obviously an abandoned pickup truck in Miami. Furthermore, and probably even worse, actually very much worse. Andrew was strapped for cash So he stopped at a pawn shop to sell one of the gold coins he had stole from Lee Miglin. A requirement when you're pawning something is to provide identification, signature, and an address. Well, he showed his IDs, signed his real name, and gave the address of the hotel he was staying at. The reason that you do all of this is that that form gets faxed over to the police department so they can cross-reference people using the pawn shop with a fugitive list. To literally catch criminals is the point of this entire runaround they do. This was July 8th, so about four days before he murdered Gianni Versace. It was sent over, and nobody even looked at it at the police department. That alone would have 100% saved Gianni Versace's life. So, now that they know where he's staying, they all go to the hotel to find him, but the room was empty. But... Two days later, the hotel realized they gave the police the wrong room number. They're like, oh, sorry, he wasn't in there because that wasn't actually his room. So they went back, but by now he is obviously gone, and all that was left in that room was his things, were his things. It would be eight days after he shot Gianni Versace before they would find him. On July 23rd, 1997, a caretaker at the Indian Creek Canal noticed that the door to one of the houseboats was open. And he knew the owner of this boat was out of town. So he walked into the boat. He didn't see anything out of the ordinary at first until he walked upstairs and came face to face with someone who was not the owner of the boat. And that person fled and locked themselves in the bedroom. The caretaker left and called for the police, thinking it was possible this man was the fugitive that they were looking for. The place was swarmed within minutes. There were police on the ground, airplanes circling, boats circling. There were snipers in nearby apartment buildings waiting for him to, like, try and escape. They were not, they were not going to mess this up again for like the 100th time. So they are yelling for him to come out. And after he fails to do so, they are authorized to use this all at 8.15 p.m. They're like, try and get him out. If you can't get him out by 8.15 p.m., get him out by any means that you possibly can. They threw gas grenades into the windows and then ran inside. And they are fully expecting like a shootout because they know he's armed. They know he's dangerous. They know he's reckless. He's just shooting anyone anyway. Nothing happened. So they cleared the first floor and headed upstairs. When they opened the bedroom door, Andrew's body was lying on the bed, and he had shot himself in the head with Jeff's gun. On August 31st, Andrew Cunanan would have been 28 years old. Sadly, he never heard the emotional plea videotaped the day he died by his longtime friend Elizabeth Coate, whose little girl was his goddaughter. 
She had said in this video, Grimmy says she loves her Uncle Monkey and hopes she'll remember that always. Your birthday will be here soon and the day after. Someone else who loves you will be five years old. Please let those be days of relief. And that's really like the last thing about Andrew Cunanan. And I couldn't really find any follow-up anything. Not that it's important. He was a terrible person. Um... After his death in Versace's will, he left 20% of the company to Donatella, 30% to his brother Santo, and the remaining 50% to his niece Allegra Versace Beck. However, Allegra was only 11 at the time, so that meant Donatella absorbed her 50% to be the majority shareholder until Allegra was 18. Johnny also had a nephew from Donatella, um, Daniel Beck. Johnny left Daniel his art collection, which included two pieces by Picasso, so not nothing. Uh, Versace and Allegra were extremely close, and she struggled for a very long time after his death. She said she barely remembers him and sometimes forget what he looked like because she was so traumatized that her brain has sort of, like, blocked everything out. Also, the Versace siblings had a sister, Fortunata, die at the age of 12 after she fell and scraped her knee and then developed tetanus. So she was at a carnival with her parents and fell and died 24 hours later. So they're no stranger to just... Fucked up tragedy. Less than three months after his death, the Versace Milan Fashion Week show went on as it would have on October 10th, 1997. But instead of his rivals sizing up the collection, they all showed up in support. Armani, Donna Caron, Prada, and Karl Lagerfeld sat in the audience alongside celebrities like Cher, Boy George, and Demi Moore. In 2018, Michael Kors purchased the Versace brand for $2.12 billion with a B dollars. Donatella would stay on as Versace's chief creative officer. Santo remains chairman and president, and collectively their family now owns the equivalent of $176 million of Capri Holdings and group stock. So Michael Kors bought Versace and sort of changed it to like uh, the Capri something. And that is the story of the murders of Jeffrey Trail, David Madsen, Lee Miglin, William Reese, and Gianni Versace. If you are unaware, Ryan Murphy did the second season of American Crime Story on this, and it was actually pretty good. I think in that show is where they sort of embellished that Versace and Andrew knew each other, but that apparently was not the case. And I think... There's a lot of stuff after Versace's death about, like, his family. I think Donatella struggled for a very long time with it. It was, like, a lot of pressure for her to take over, like, her brother's vision. Which, she's done an amazing job. Some of the outfits that she has done are some of my favorite pieces. I think she did the gold dress with the cross that Kim Kardashian wore to the Met, maybe. I love Love, love that dress. She might have done the beaded lover bodysuit that Taylor Swift is using on the Eras tour. So, yeah, Donatella did great, but she was very messed up. I think she said, like, she had started doing drugs to cope with it, and it was just, like, just terrible, and honestly, for no reason. None of these murders should have happened anyway, but just, like, a random killing spree. And there is a lot of debate of whether to call Andrew Cunanan a serial killer or a spree killer. And I think it's more appropriate to call him a spree killer because I think, I don't know a whole lot, but I think the serial killer thing has, you have to have like time between victims, like a significant amount of time from the start to the end. And this was just like rapid within months. It was done and over with. So let me know what you think. Let me know if you also thought that Andrew Cunanan and Gianni Versace knew each other because that was kind of shocking to me. And that is all. If you are a subscriber, I will see you Friday to talk about the life and death of one of my most favorite historical figures. You don't want to miss it. And I promise it's not six minutes long. I'm still getting used to the lengths of these because I know by page how long something would usually be with Taryn. And it's completely different now because it's just me. So for instance, this would have been much, much longer. I could have like 
stuff this into two parts, maybe. Nah, maybe not. But this would have been like one of the longer episodes. And the one sh- the one shot, that's how they're called anymore. If you're new here, this podcast stemmed from a true crime podcast I did with my best friend. But Friday's episode, the length of it would have been a full episode if it was with Taryn. So I'm just sort of trying to like work through the lengths. I think this one will be like the perfect amount of length. So I will see you Friday for that. If you don't want to subscribe, completely fine. I will see you on Wednesday with a brand new episode. Thank you very much. I will see you then. Bye.